Uh, hi, and welcome to the next, next session. Uh, Philippe Coval will uh, share his um, initiative for Abandonware. This is a community effort to restore old, um, old software and to bring back life into it. Philippe and I are, uh, have been working together on several open source projects. Uh, we know each other for quite some time, uh, including our favorite Tizen project, Outworld in Great Linux Geneva. Uh, if you have been to FOSDEM, you probably have seen Philippe either in the embedded developer room or in the Mozilla uh, developer room uh, where he is uh, frequently presenting. Philippe, thank you very much for uh, joining OpenFest. I hope to see you next year in Sofia live. Uh, <laughs> Or, or maybe the year after that. Um. It's not the year, everybody. So yeah, I know Leon for quite a long time, and um, we are crossing our road between different open source projects. And he tried to pressure me to present something, and I think it was a good, uh, a good idea to present uh, overseas because at the beginning of this year, you know, there is a lot of issue and. Uh, Kind of perturbance. So I prepared the presentation from my city in uh, Rain. In uh, I think it was in about in uh, maybe March or April. I don't remember exactly. And there was a lockdown ongoing. So I present. I prepared the presentation, but I was unable to present it uh, online. So thank you a lot for giving me this opportunity to present uh, this uh, little effort. So it's not a big project, it's just um, a discussion about uh, what can we do with uh, abandoned ware. So let me introduce myself. I'm Philippe Coval. I'm a software engineer from France, and uh, I'm based in Brittany, and I've been uh, contributing to open source projects for a long time, from on Debian project, on uh, Migo for the cell phones, and uh, also Tizen and some other Linux system, and I'm currently part of Mozilla Web Program, and I'm work on uh, IoT and a uh, little VR stuff also. I've been involved into the industry open source projects like uh, Tizen operating system, was I was in Intel, Yocto for automotive, and uh, my main contribution when I was at Samsung was the open connectivity reference implementation called IoTivity. So feel free to contact me. Um, I have an address here. You can see some previous presentation material, some videos, some social updates about some experiments. I'm trying to share as much as I can. And I'm currently available for, for working or cooperating on open source projects. So you can free to reach me uh, also from this uh, social network, the Fediverse, where I can show you some updates and some video demos on YouTube. So what are we talking about today? So that's amazing because the last word of the previous presentation was dead because the project the space uh, work was abandoned by Red Hat somehow. It's archive on Big Eater, but uh, I think it's we are in a situation where the source code is still available, but the development is not uh, ongoing. So the software is, as we call, abandoned. So it's not finished. Uh, it's just stop at uh, some, some 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 state of the development. But uh, what uh, we can do with open source software is trying to resume the development. This is what say, the previous presenter I, I, uh, tried to explain. It didn't start from scratch. They started from something that already existed. And just they just uh, take the source and trying to add some features, change the name, and do ongoing development. So that's the strength of open source software. Software will never die if the source are remaining, that's for sure. Because if the source code is gone, all you can do is trying to do something with a binary, eventually try to patch the binaries to add more features. So I have a couple of examples I can show about this. But if the source remains, we are somehow safe. So software will be abandoned sooner or later, that's for sure, because the company will probably don't have any relevant business. Um, the product, the abandoned aware, is a product that's typically software and it's ignored by the owner or the manufacturer or for some reason nobody cares about it. So there is no support available for it. 
So we have some kind of dead software that nobody can uh, do anything interesting out of it unless it's open source because you have the permission to use the source code and to do a lot of things. But this is possible only if some people are trying to do some investigation on the source code or trying to build it again. So this software and open source generally is uh, relying on a community. If you have a, an open source project without community, it's quite the same as the it was not open source. But at least it gives the uh, opportunity to the opportunity to take back the project. So the challenge we have here on this uh, problem is that over the time, code is not like wine. It doesn't get better and better over time. Usually it, it gets uh, worse and worse and, and it can end as unusable at all. So you have um, you need some kind of, uh, you have a dependency on the developers of the project and you don't have, if it's an open source, you don't have any established uh, contract with them. It only depends on the, the good be the goodwill of the author so you can contract the author and you can establish some some uh, commercial partnership and then you can get some results but if the upstream is no more active on this you are in trouble so software you need users and also developers so we have a one-to-one -one interdependence uh, the community is uh, is um, is giving feedback to the software auto and also the software auto need user to get uh, some feedback and some some change sometimes because there is a lot of uh, context are changing so probably there is a lot of feedback and fixes coming from the community so here is a typical lifespan of an operating of an uh, open source project first the author develops the code then it publishes it so at this time the project is open source so i want to make clear about this because there is many projects that claim to be open source, but they are not sharing any source. So the compromise is not a source code, so keep this in mind. So once the code is published, uh, any users can use the code and do whatever they can and the license agree. And most of users who are just uh, free riders, they will just uh, take and give nothing back. But some of them will give you some feedback and they probably report bugs and uh, if you're lucky, you can even fix this. So the community is uh, really helpful in this situation. And uh, developers from upstream of community are adding features and fixes and introducing new bugs and fixes and so on, and so on and so on, and then they fade away. So maybe users go to a different project or users are uh, uh, different assignments are working on different projects. There is a lack of interest, a lack of funding, and uh, people can get, be unreachable for different uh, uh, cause. So you need to, to remind that an uh, open stream developer is also a human being and he, get, he can face a lot of uh, surprise in life. Like uh, we have this uh, sustainability challenge and let me illustrate this with uh, an article that was sent to me just before I was about to, to present this abandonware project. That there was a headline of the register that uh, states that uh, some JavaScript uh, library downloaded 26 million of time a week uh, is in trouble because the main developer went to prison because he was killing someone with a motorbike. So that's a, a problem. How to do with this situation? That's not something easy, specifically uh, if there is many people relying on this uh, guy. So we have different kind of strategy to face this. So as I said, that uh, open source user on my state and make patches. So you can uh, keep your fork and trying to make your program or library safe in your project. And but there is nobody in the upstream to merge all the downstream parts for the community. So in the end, we have many, many people doing the same in different places. And uh, those people will probably not uh, develop uh, their version forever at the same time. So we are in the same situation, like if there was one author, there are many authors that are not cooperating. And in the end, they will probably gave up uh, taking care of this uh, component. So this leads to some problem of uh, 
insecurity because there are some vulnerability in the code of course because people are making mistakes and also there are vulnerabilities in the dependencies of the programs and uh, it's because uh, uh, only there are not many programs that are not composed of other programs so we have a, a full graph of dependencies of dependencies of different programs so if something is not secure the whole thing is not secure so you need to take care of this yeah. so you can some people security experts are sharing some patches about uh, vulnerabilities and how to apply them so that's a really um, valuable contribution for the security uh, people but if you are patching some software, if you are making any change, it could have some side effects and it could eventually create more damage than fixing the mistake because if your software is doing is using something in a special way which is not uh, commonly used and is something private, nobody will try to audit if there is any issue on this. So you need to, to, to consider that uh, most uh, security uh, uh, vulnerability are found in open source software for closed software that's more difficult so uh, we need a, a minimal um, chain of maintenance uh, for each part of the software that's the only way to get something uh, more readable so let me find another another experience so somebody found a, a module it's a javascript one which was a ton downloaded a six uh, million a week and uh, it has no license so in terms of legal that's a problem that could be a problem specifically if you are depending on it uh, no maintainer is identified and nobody is giving uh, any help or feedback on this uh, uh, repository and it has been published uh, six years ago and it said that uh, this component is used by a lot of companies so we are in a situation that there is a high risk on this uh, component so we need uh, we cannot uh, replace everyone but we can try to cooperate to, to give uh, the best uh, effort to maintain software so what I'm trying to propose in this presentation is how can we organize us, ourselves to do co-maintenance for an orphan project and try to establish um, a minimal level of trust between each other and the community. So currently, uh, the own project is only a few, uh, it's uh, only a place where people can try to work together. So the first link is a, a description about what is this abandonware effort and then a github uh, or gitlab depends on the people because there is no single infrastructure there should be several so it's better to think um, decentralized at the beginning and people can find issue and try to share code and try to see how can we cooperate so keep this link uh, this is my <coughs> these three links are the on the main uh, main door for this so let's talk about trust that's a problem because if we don't need each other and there is no common interest it's pretty hard to, to establish trust so something you should know you should remember about trust that trust should be bi-directional bi so if you trust someone you should expect these people trust you this is not always the case so trust is uh, really trust when it's uh, in both direction so there are other use case where trust is quite interesting where people are trying to rely on a, on a chain of trust and uh, using like uh, GP software to make sure that one binary is can move from one hand to another and to make sure that uh, the people who are issuing the message is the actual people so PGP is uh, is has been established as community web of trust and uh, we are trying to rely on something similar so another way also to trust people is to see if they are already committed to a trustworthy organization. So for instance, uh, Debian uh, is trying to integrate new developers with uh, uh, some verification on their identity and also their will to do the, the things in the Debian interest, matching the Debian constitution and not trying to inject some kind of uh, malware or do nasty things. So that's the best effort uh, 
way to establish trust and we are not setting up something different we probably try to rely on previous projects that already have this kind of uh, trust uh, procedure to make sure that uh, the, the person is not coming from nowhere and to, to do nasty things so there is an example of uh, a project that uh, where I try to commit myself as a internal of a project and to promise that I will not do any harm and I made this in a statement in a commit in a commit uh, pull request which is signed so if uh, I'm doing things against what I promise I can be let's say rejected from the project so I try to detail some flaws or different procedure and uh, if we are sharing code I want to insist that it would be interesting to to track the most we can the patches where are the patches coming from as it be forwarded to the upstream because even if the upstream is not um, giving any feedback if you are sharing this on uh, the upstream side maybe the community can look at what you're doing and give you some feedback so if you are sharing earlier better it is so feel free to give links of uh, different ID or different place where the software and the context of the software is discussed so yeah forward to upstream first that's the best uh, practice to get feedback and to avoid uh, doing damage or mistake and propagate them and you have to pay your um, technology debt later and if upstream is moving a little bit like uh, integrating uh, new things we need to rebase on it as soon as possible because we don't want to fork forever we want to try to be as close up upstream in case if upstream is taking back the maintenance of the project we can merge back all the changes and of course uh, we made some effort to set up some uh, continuous integration and delivery to make uh, the flow easier and try to detect mistakes and try to raise uh, a minimum level of quality so yeah, I can give some details about this uh, last step so we try to automate the most we can I've been using a GitHub Action, some some projects. That's interesting because uh, we I used some Travis uh, bot before, and there are other way to trying to run some additional check on server side. But GitHub Action is try it can push this uh, a little bit forward. Like uh, I was able to set up some some workflows that if uh, people are making some comment in a specific way, they can release new version of the, the software which is a uh, community maintenance so that's interesting because it doesn't rely on the let's say the the master of the project the community itself can decide to make a new release and uh, it uh, will go through a review like uh, like uh, any regular patches so it can be automated uh, using github action at the same time if it's on GitHub or other open source repositories, the code could be scanned by bots. So you can track issue, you can track uh, eventually some automatic patches like uh, dependencies update and so on. Um, and I try to I had set up on some projects some, some bots to post some updates on a social channel. So this means that people who can get informed through uh, Mastodon or the Fediverse or even Twitter, then can track that there is ongoing activity. And if there is something bad, maybe I can attract them to the review uh, address. Uh, something interesting also, we are like um, the NPM uh, repository is proposing like uh, this namespace uh, system. So this means that uh, all the fork and the abandonware can have this kind of uh, abandonware prefix. So all the projects uh, which are maintained can be in a single place. Uh, so that's something interesting that should be, I believe, should be replicated to other projects. So this way you have some extra context on the naming of the module. And uh, what goes next? Uh, maybe we can go further in automation. Um, automation can be good but it can be also bad if it's going to generate garbage so there is two different approach either we try to automate using machine learning or this kind of uh, 
um, black magic on source code, or the other um, approach is trying to rely on collective intelligence to try to make sure that uh, everyone that can be part of it can be uh, like um, a watchdog about what is going on. So the main uh, place to find uh, the procedures that I'm currently writing, you are free to make some suggestion uh, using a request. How can we improve different step about uh, transferring a project uh, from one organization to another, how to do uh, maintenance, how to set up uh, um, cooperation with upstream and so on. And there are a couple of examples. So the page is quite uh, small, so you can get uh, used to it. Uh, you can read it in a five minutes. And if there is any feedback, also feel free to reach on GitHub, for instance. If you don't want to reach GitHub, you can suggest a different place and we can have the discussion elsewhere. There is no strong relationship. So here is an example about uh, a Bluetooth um, module for um, Node.js. So here is the upstream. I don't remember exactly, but it started to not support uh, Node version 10, I believe. So people, less and less people are using it and no feedback from upstream. So uh, I was a bit annoyed because I use this project in a Mozilla web sync project and we wanted to support a new node version, but we had some dependency on this module. So we had to make it work with current node version. So we forked it and we try to uh, support uh, current node version and we share it in a different uh, place using this Amazonware prefix. So if you compare both uh, image, you can see that the uh, upstream is a bit, uh, the downloads are decreasing while outside it's, it's, it's uh, increasing. So this means that people are, there is a transition from upstream to this uh, downstream uh, living version. Um, I wish that upstream can merge our change to try to release a new version with a uh, new fixes, so we share the patches, but we don't have any feedback yet. So we try to connect uh, different people and no feedback at all. So we are in this situation and we probably stay in this situation until upstream try to decide to transfer the maintenance of the project to the abandonware organization or elsewhere, it doesn't matter. But uh, for this uh, time we are in this situation. So anyway, pick is welcome. Uh, something that can be valuable is trying to identify often projects where there is a community that want to keep using this project and eventually try to make more patches so you can report uh, this to this uh, ticket and uh, more we are, we are welcome that for sure we have like uh, I don't remember exactly maybe a dozen of package where people are reviewing and sharing patches so uh, nobody can be expert in all the software, so we need more reviewers, that's for sure, but we are trying to merge patches at least faster than upstream. Tester can be helpful at the same time, and uh, mentors that can uh, help a new open source contributor to share their patches in a, in a more efficient way. This means make smaller patches, trying to rebase an upstream, fix the conflicts, uh, and trying to um, teach them how to cooperate uh, the smoothest uh, way possible. Relationship with upstream, downstream and other folks can be helpful also because if we want to, to get together in the same place, uh, probably we need to reach the people to try to explain why it can be uh, valuable to work together in this place and why what are the limitations can be also interesting. And of course, uh, trying to improve the automation so this means supporting more routing system, different kind of uh, pull chains, and uh, anything we can do to satisfy the most user can be valuable. Of course, feedback is welcome. Uh, any support welcome. Funding can be helpful because I've been doing this in a voluntary basis for now. Uh, I'm not the only one. I've got some people uh, who uh, made a lot of efforts and I want to give them Credit. And uh, if you want to 
if some project is really interesting for you and you want to establish a, a long-term maintenance, let us know. That can be uh, interesting if somebody else is maintaining some of our projects elsewhere. And then we can focus on uh, the other orphans. That's uh, of an age um, purpose. So yeah, and if you have any suggestion, feel free to reach us. So in summary, uh, software will be uh, maintaining that for sure. That's uh, the life of uh, software. There is not many software that have been developed uh, over decades or maybe a century, probably we know in the future, but it will be unfound and maintained. But uh, user might still need some legacy software for some reason, just for preservation issue, or eventually for just uh, um, some purpose or just from a legal perspective. So that should probably should be um, the software will be probably stay the dependency will be probably stay longer than the software itself. And security matters, because as I said, over the time, there is a lot of uh, vulnerabilities found, a lot of techniques. So all code can be uh, the subject to uh, exploit. So you need to, to take care of it. If you want to have, provide a minimum level of security, either you write everything from scratch and you, have, you are maintaining your code every day and trying to get uh, the latest uh, security information and tricks are uh, easier you need to delegate and this uh, in this situation you need to make sure that uh, the software is properly maintained so we need trust for to provide this security and uh, we need a uh, lot of procedure to make it uh, easier and automation can be also a way to to um, help the community and as i said uh, if uh, Community needs software, uh, in the other side, the software needs community. So Abandonware can be a place for this kind of better effort cooperation. And we can start by identifying projects, see if uh, the project is suitable for community maintenance in Abandonware place. And uh, if not, or uh, after, can be adopted by somebody else. So maybe also a discussion regarding some software. So while I'm here, I want just to make some reminder about ethics uh, because we, I believe that uh, we are not cooperating enough. So a lot of people are doing the same thing in different places. So in a, comp in a business and competitive environment, it could make sense. But in the case of maintaining old software, it doesn't make sense to do this in a different places. There is no business value in uh, doing this. So it doesn't make sense. We need to try to to share the effort. So I believe that everyone, every developer has a responsibility of the stability of the software. And also it's not only software, it's about everything. So yeah, I shared a couple of links you can uh, read later if you get back to the slides that can be an inspiration for building a, a different future. So I shared some resources also, you can check them later online. So the main Place to find uh, current material is on abandonwaregithub.io. This is just a static uh, web page, so don't expect uh, too much things. And uh, yeah, you can. Uh, I can take some question now if there is uh, anybody who wants to ask. So, Leon, feel free to join again the, the room, but I can read the chat. So. Philip, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, and I believe uh, it, it will become a uh, more and more popular topic in the years to come because of the nature, how the world uh, works, and how, unfortunately, uh, over the time, more and more projects will need this title of help. Uh, so we have uh, a few questions from uh, Jordan Ivanov. Uh, what is the criteria that the project has to meet to be uh, eligible for abandonware? Um, it's like a children, I believe, if the parents is not taking too, too much care of, uh, of their kids, they should try to, to propose somebody else to take care of them. So if the project, there is no strong, uh, strong um, rule to, to decide. I believe that it could make sense to, to 
try to discuss with upstream and if there is no feedback for let's say several months we are in a situation where upstream is not a uh, is not a uh, is not uh, able to take care of the project so if there is let's say some depend on the context if there is some huge vulnerabilities that should be there just as soon as possible for instance because it's uh, critical we can decide to fork the project in the abandoned wear uh, as soon as it's needed, so it can be, let's say, in a week. And uh, it can be temporary, because if upstream is taking in account this uh, problem, we can just rebase on the upstream and decide that uh, we are aligned, and then upstream is red, so the project is not ups is not uh, abandoned anymore, so it just can start in our repository until upstream is giving up again, for instance. So I would say that any project uh, that can be useful and can be patched can be uh, can bound into the abandonware base. If there is nobody committed to, to share any patch or any, any fix or provide any community feedback, it doesn't make sense to talk in our place because there is there will not be more activity. But it can be interesting to identify it. So I would say if there is a, some kind of pressure for the community, for the user to have a community maintenance version, yeah, come on, you, you're welcome. But yeah, there is no stronger, uh, just suggest it. So to do this, um, open an issue on the meta project on GitHub and uh, we'll try to do the, what is making the most sense for this project. Can anyone change, join the initiative? I think so. Uh, anyone is free to join and comment and uh, try to help. But uh, to get access to critical things like uh, merging patches, we uh, probably ask them to uh, provide a minimal minimal level of uh, commitment. This means verifying their ident identity, trying to see if they are already committed to some open source project, and trying to see if they are uh, good citizens. That's uh, the only way. So I believe that this can be this decision can be also managed by the community itself. I just didn't mention something uh, in this presentation, but uh, I should give back credit to the Debian project because I used to be a contributor on uh, Debian and uh, what I'm shared here is mostly replicating some pattern I've seen in the Debian project. That, uh, so Debian is known to be very picky and hard to contribute to. So I try to do this in a more relaxed way outside the different project. It can, can be valuable for different distro or different uh, communities. This is not uh, focused on packaging of software, so it doesn't make sense to do this in Debian side. It can be done in a different places. Uh, so. There are a few more questions. Uh, now, the first one is coming from the contact form of the live stream at openfest.org. Uh, thanks for the great talk. A question regarding what you said about us uh, being in the pre-cooperation age. I have had many cases where people start a new project instead of building upon what already exists because uh, they believe they would do it better from scratch, which honestly is rarely the case. Could you uh, give any advice on overcoming this mentality? Yeah, that's true. Um, and I think this can be a, a subject for uh, world presentation maybe next year <laughs> yeah but uh, starting something from scratch uh, can be also interesting so to recap we can if you go alone you go fast if you go with others you go further far rest far further right. so in sometimes uh, when you're not uh, very um, uh, use when you're trying to learn software development and so on, it can be interesting to to do something in a quick and dirty way and trying to learn about uh, how to deal with uh, tools. Uh, I can, for instance, many people don't really know how to use Git, so if they're trying to to join an existing project, it can be really uh, painful for them, and some of them can just go away and they will not try to to learn uh, new tools because they, they, they don't really have any interest. At the same time, starting something when something else for, for a specific purpose and when something else already exists, it doesn't make sense, that's for sure. We have too many 
everyone agrees that there is too many distro for of Linux, for instance. So that's, that's, that's a fact. But we should not prevent, we should not stop people creating a new distro because creating a, a distro or just a single image can be really interesting from a learning perspective, that's for sure. And if you donate with yourself, you can share it to others. So a new distro is born. Oh, uh, so, yeah. There's a question. Uh, a balance uh, to find. There is a question from uh, uh, Jordan, which is coming in the same direction. Uh, have you had uh, cases of projects dying immediately after they have been uh, resurrected? Um, I would not say they are fully resurrected, just, just uh, in a coma state, for instance. So, um, if there are, in, in my experience, uh, all the modules I've been maintaining with the community are still used. Um, if there is some technical issue which is too hard to fix, probably we'll get in this situation, but it's not the case uh, yet. Uh, most of the module I've been uh, maintaining were in JavaScript. Uh, all the language are also can be supported, but let's say if for some reason some compiler is broken and the language is dying, all the software lying on it will probably be very hard for them to survive. So. Yeah, I don't have any example yet, but it's it's a small project. It's something I just made for my home for just uh, unblocking the situation, and I think it could be valuable for others. Uh, if we want to, something I didn't share yet. Uh, let's see if I, I think yeah, I can mention this project, uh, Software Heritage. Maybe you already know about it. If not, that's a. Uh, a UNESCO project uh, that started at uh, in my area, the French uh, Research Institute, would try to make a, a collection of all the open source software and to for preservation uh, for preservation purposes and trying to do some analysis of this uh, software. So we are somehow complementary because they are doing this from an, arch an archivist point of view, while. Uh, the Amazon Web project is more from a community and ongoing development point of view. And uh, something also that should be mentioned when you talk about uh, adopting projects and not starting everything from scratch. For students, for example, it can be a really good exercise to get into a project and try to, to fix a problem in a in a, an obsolete version, an obsolete software, because that's probably so, something they have to do with in their life of the developer. So uh, instead of creating something new from scratch, it could it could be uh, really valuable to learn how to to dig into the problem and trying to find a, a way to fix it. Yeah, so that's something. Um, it can be harder sometimes, but I believe is that we'll learn uh, much more. Yeah. Uh, there is another question, actually, uh, about uh, the topic that you've started. Can anyone join the initiative? Are there any criteria? Uh, yes, I, I think I already replied. Uh, ju just uh, send a few, a few, just say hello on, on GitHub issue and trying to propose uh, where you want to help and uh, we will welcome you. Uh, unless if you are suspicious, in this case, we are <laughs> be a little, a little picky and ask you some question and trying to prove how a good citizen you are. Uh, do you operate only in GitHub? That's another question. Uh, come uh, no, not, not only GitHub. Uh, I created uh, the same on GitLab. I think there is only a couple of projects, maybe maybe only one. I, I, I didn't uh, really look at this uh, recently. Um, no, I, I don't want to establish a strong dependency on GitHub. And for free number purpose, it's not the best, that's for sure. But on the other hand, they are providing those automation tools and all the infrastructure that can be a little uh, expensive to set up with a limited budget. So I think it's a, it's a good deal using GitHub and the most of the many projects on, on GitHub. So forking and transferring projects can be done in, in only into GitHub. I hope someday we can transfer one project from GitHub to GitLab or other organizations that can be uh, more for the community perspective, but uh, yeah, that's uh, the way it is today. If there is any suggestion to make it uh, better or in a different place or more decentralized, I really be really happy to consider this. Yeah. Um, there's one question that uh, I wanted to ask you. 
I, I was wondering, based on your experience and the examples that you uh, shared in the slides about these NPM packages, uh, which are the most common uh, reasons for a maintainer to stop maintaining uh, the project that he has created? Ah, that's a tricky question because uh, usually those kind of maintainers are not reachable anymore. So if you're lucky, I'd say, that, okay, do whatever you want. I, I don't uh, want to do anything more on this project. So that's uh, the most uh, helpful situation. Then we can ask them why, what's the problem? I believe that uh, most of the time they are busy on other tasks because they didn't see some period of their, uh, of their time for their work or probably they move to a different uh, project or technology so they don't uh, have the time to keep this keep uh, maintaining or right, maybe the, the interest is lacking all the time. But uh, most of the time we don't have any feedback so we don't even know if these people are alive. So. That uh, it will require a private uh, investigator to know what why the project has been uh, often. But it's not surprised that uh, for business reason people are moving from different business or they did this uh, in a different situation where they were student and as a uh, full time employee on something else. And I don't, abandoning a, a software is not a bad thing. I want to to say this. Because we are human beings, we have different priorities, so that's that's sort of totally normal. You don't have to feel guilty if you are an open stream, if you are an upstream developers. But uh, something you can do, which require a little, a little, um, a little time and uh, effort, is trying to identify in somebody in your community that can take care of the project and trying to make him evolve. Uh, outside of your scope, so that's uh, the best situation. Yeah. Uh, what about companies? Uh, you you had career in some of the largest companies, making some of the greatest uh, projects uh, that we all use, such as Intel and Samsung. Uh, those companies are using a lot of open source uh, uh, projects, creating a lot of open source projects. Uh, is this uh, project with abandoning? Uh, is this problem with abandoning uh, the project uh, valid for large companies as well? I think so, specifically for them, because um, I could give some specific example, but but you can imagine that um, let's say you have a company which is uh, which is using uh, let's say a specific type of uh, codex, for instance, and they have this in a different range of products. So if the project of the codex library is abandoned, they have to maintain it either in a common place for all their products, or different team will use different uh, version of this uh, product library. So the effort is uh, duplicated, and uh, we need to make sure they are doing this the right way, and if they want, if the, they are not uh, merging back together, probably this, com this, this product and this labor library will be not compatible in the future, so they have a big issue. So it could make sense to identify a place to resume the development and at least consolidate the development in a single uh, tree. And for this, uh, open source uh, foundation are, are good for this because they can try to provide the infrastructure and also uh, the visibility to get uh, other contribution for other company. So yeah, company who have not business into a specific abandoned library I believe it's it's nonsense to keep maintaining it uh, in behind doors, unless if they have unlimited budget and developers, they can do it if they want. But uh, it's a waste if everybody is doing this at the same time. So uh, I to answer the question, I believe that uh, a big software company we are not specifically into open source software. We are using open source. Um, they could evolve and try to have a more community approach and trying to avoid duplication of effort and trying to, to share what can be valuable for the community and also for them, for sure, because that's the main reason they, they would decide to share or open new stuff. I think we have time for one last, last question. And yeah. uh, because we know each other for quite some time, and as far as I remember, uh, you were an Amiga user 
back in the 90s. I am, yeah. Uh, so what about companies like Commodore, uh, companies that doesn't exist anymore? Um, yeah. Is this uh, something that uh, is valid for them, uh, the, this project? Yes, I think so. You're, you're lucky because I resurrected my Amiga like uh, <laughs> a month ago. I wanted to make sure it was booting again, so I just unpacked uh, it and trying to plug it. There was a lot of garbage on the screen, but after I've cleaned it up, it's working again. So I had a look about what the Amiga community was doing 20 years later, because last time I think it was about year 2000. And uh, that's amazing, yeah. The Amiga community is, uh, I'm not really involved into it, but that's a uh, really good, um, I, I we could make a festival about them because those people know that the platform is somehow uh, obsolete, but there are a network of uh, a repository of software which is called Aminet, and there are a few updates uh, every week. That's uh, crazy. People are still doing new games, new utilities, and so on. And more amazingly, we have people who have re-implemented those Amiga, Amiga computers on FPGA systems. So somehow they are reviving the the, the hardware. And a lot of people are trying to play their uh, all the their games where they were teenagers. But there are also ongoing development. People are trying to also uh, merge Linux kernel and Amiga runtime to make a new kind of uh, of uh, hybrid system. So Commodore is gone. That's for sure. So there was a lot of uh, hope into the future of um, uh, people who acquire the. IP of the of the company, but I'm not aware they made uh, anything uh, as big as the Amiga. But now the community is somehow uh, ensuring the future of it by providing new hardware to run this uh, software, and uh, the the open source development is also targeting Amiga. I've seen port of uh, Amiga port of um, many software like uh, I things like some web browser, JavaScript on time, Python community, and this is also a port to Amiga. So even if the hardware is really weak, there is a place for ongoing um, development. That's interesting because at the time, uh, open source wasn't very popular. It was a closed development for sure. There were some shareware,s a lot of people were sharing information, source code eventually, but it was not an open source platform like Linux. And now it's uh, Go, it's finally going in this direction uh, 40, no, not 40, 30 years later. So, yeah, there is still hope. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our time is up. Uh, thanks again for joining. Thanks to all volunteers uh, making uh, OpenFest and helping us uh, uh, with, uh, with the questions. Uh, hope to see you uh, next year in person in Sofia. Yeah. And I think uh, we should wrap up our talk with uh, something very open source, maybe long live open source or open source forever. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> and can I just add something? There is uh, another going uh, event uh, I invite you to join. This is uh, the Jan uh, conference online. It's about the games and it will be fun. And uh, if you, you have 30 seconds, there is a project I'm, I'm presenting there. So it's a pinball running on a software this which has been uh, not maintained uh, 20 years ago and I recently made a, a couple of patch to make uh, this uh, pin cab uh, pinball table that's an example I wanted to share you later <laughs> oh this is awesome <laughs> I, I knew you look you, you would like it <laughs> thank you very thank much you. bye bye and